So again, just to prepare you, in the words of the parents who were in my study, it's a lot of work. It's really a lot of work for a couple days. Um, but then it's over, is really the idea. I had one family that was in the study, I guess about six months after the study was over, sent me a picture of the, the kids in Disneyland and said, we took our diaper budget and went to Disneyland. So that mom earned her trip to Disneyland and was thinking about it the whole time. I'm not gonna pay for diapers anymore. I'm on the plane and, and she did it. So, you know, you might have a long-term reward in mind too because diapers are expensive. That's one of the main things I hear from families. I can't believe, it's like a smoking habit or something. It's a crazy amount of money. Um, especially when you get into the bigger sizes and the overnights, oh, terrible. So. I'll get into now the details of the plan, and I'd like to take your questions at the end. If you have burning questions throughout, that's okay. Um, but yeah, I'd, I'd like you to hear the whole thing. Hear me out. There's still a little bit of eyebrow raising, so hear me out on the whole thing before I get any questions. So uh, the names of the components, and I'll go through each one, give you a definition, some kind of do's and don'ts around them. The first one's increased fluid, so we've alluded to that a little bit. Then there's scheduled toilet sittings, reinforcement for correct toileting, redirection for accidents, and scheduled chair sittings. So as we go through, you might think about kind of the similarities and differences between what Pat talked about and what I'll talk about, and think about your child and which approach might be right for you and all that sort of thing. And then I think at the end we'll talk as well about choosing the right one for your child again, um, now after you've heard them both. So increased fluids, the definition of this is to um, give the trainee as much liquid to drink as possible, um, within reason, but at least every half hour you'd provide a full cup of a preferred liquid. So the reason we do this is the more liquid consumed, the more he or she will urinate, right? So the more opportunities to learn. So having the trainee urinate as many times as possible throughout the intensive training phase will help them learn more quickly. It truly will. So if you think of it in terms of something you've learned that's kind of hard that you don't do often, like maybe parallel parking. I remember learning to parallel park. You just do it again and again and again and again until you get it, right? Like multiple times in a row. Because really, when do we need to parallel park? Oh, once every couple days. If you learn that way, it would take you a lot longer to learn well. That's probably why some of us still aren't good parallel parkers. We should have done a whole bunch in a row, right? So um, that's one of the reasons. Just many trials of learning, especially for people with special needs, who have any kind of learning challenges, the more trials you can provide, the more opportunities to be successful, the faster the rate of acquisition. So that applies to many, many things, right? That's coming back to just good instruction is what makes toilet training happen. And if you think of it in terms of percentages too, right? So if someone's only peeing four times a day on average and two of them are accidents, so you're kind of trying to toilet train, okay, let's see if we can figure this out. So that means 50% of their day was unsuccessful. But if they pee 20 times a day and two times are accidents, they were 90% successful with the same amount of accidents, right? So the more opportunities provide, um, the more likely you are to have a high percentage of success as well. So it's, it's really important and I can't emphasize it enough. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about this one. So a few do's for you. Have a variety of liquids available. So if you think my kid likes grapefruit juice, they might not like a lot of grapefruit juice because you've probably never given them a lot of grapefruit juice. So have to have other varieties available. Just anything you think they might possibly like to drink. Um, give frequent refills. So they sh the child should always have a, a cup on the go. And use the whatever cup they drink most comfor comfortably from. I've had parents before say, I'm trying to get my kid off bottles. I really don't want them drinking from a, a baby bottle anymore, which, which makes perfect sense, and I'd love to work on it with you after toilet training. Right now, if they like drinking from a baby bottle, they can drink from a baby bottle, and we all kind of agree on that, and they, they usually see where I'm coming from. Um, and salty snacks of some kind that will increase the trainee's desire to drink as well certainly help. Um, and it, yeah, again, it's not, it's not the moment to worry about things like too much sugar within reason. Um, if the child really likes apple juice, it's really important that they drink a lot. It really is. And I mean, yes, that's a lot of sugar, but do you want them toilet trained? Give them the apple juice is kind of the, all I can say about that. So if you don't, if you run out of their favorite liquid, don't just stop 
Get, oh, okay, well that was all the apple juice we had. This is a really, really important part. You cannot do rapid toilet training without this. Um, so if this is the kind of thing that's making you squeamish, thinking, I don't wanna pump my kid full of liquid, this isn't the approach for you. It's a, that, that's how important it is. It's a really, really important part. Um, so if, yeah, if you, I told the parents in the study, if you run out of apple juice, call me, I'll be over with the apple juice. It's that important. Um, don't give up if they're not drinking independently. You don't force them to drink, but do offer it constantly. Don't just have it beside them, just kind of, here you go, here you go, pretty frequently. And if it's a favorite liquid, most kids will drink a lot. And a lot of families, when they, they book to work with me in a month, so we're gonna do rapid toilet training next month, they'll often ask, well, what can I do right now? I wanna get my child ready. And really, we like to introduce kind of the whole intervention package at once. I don't want them to prep their child. It's just, let's go for it when we go for it. But one thing parents, I tell them they can do is sample around, find out what liquids their child really likes, see what it takes to get them to drink a lot, that kind of thing, like goldfish really help. One mom learned, now I know I gotta have the goldfish crackers on hand in conjunction with the orange juice, that kind of thing. So experimenting around what helps your child drink a lot can be a really good way to prep. So the next component I'll talk about is called scheduled toilet sittings. So the definition of this is the trainee will stay seated on the toilet for a predetermined amount of time. And I'll tell you a little bit about how you predetermine those amounts of time in a moment. So the first sitting starts when possible, as soon as the trainee gets up in the morning. Reason being, most of us have to pee when we get up in the morning, right? So the trainee can look at books, watch DVDs, play games, anything that's a seated activity that will make it easier for him or her to stay seated. So truly, they can do anything on that toilet that'll help them stay seated. Um, and they can get off the toilet when they pee or poo or at the end of that predetermined amount of time if they haven't yet peed or pooed. So the first interval, the first scheduled toilet sitting always 30 minutes, very standard across all the toilet training research, all the work I've done. Um, so they start on the toilet for 30 minutes. They probably have to pee anyway because they just woke up and hopefully you caught them before that first diaper pee a lot of kids do laying in bed. Um, so they probably have to pee because of that. They're immediately getting a lot of liquids. They might have to pee right away. So you keep them on the toilet for that 30 minutes. Um, and then following a success on the toilet, so elimination in the toilet of any kind, um, they get a break. So in that 30 minutes, say they pee at minute 18, the break starts there. They don't have to wait till the end of the 30 minutes, they get their break. So the kid learns, I get a reward and I get off the toilet, right? So they get a, a better reward than whatever they're playing with, plus a break from the toilet. So this will become a little more clear as we go. So the reason we do this is the more time the trainee spends on the toilet, the more likely they are to pee or poo while on, on the toilet, right? If you, it kind of eliminates as much as possible the chance of an accident. Because if you're on the toilet all day, you'll just happen to pee or poo at some point, um, and then you'll get a huge reward for it, which will increase the likelihood you'll do it more in the future. So, um, yeah, decreasing the prob probability of accidents, increasing the probability of success by hanging out on the toilet pretty much all day. So the way it works is, as a trainee eliminates, so pees or poos successfully more often, the schedule will change to allow for more time off the toilet. So the 30 minutes phase doesn't last long. As soon as they're successful, three times, so that's a good measure, so they're successful three times, then their next sitting becomes shorter and they become shorter and shorter and shorter until they're not happening anymore. So I'm hoping you can see how this part of the intervention works with the increased fluids. That's how much the child needs to be drinking. They should have to pee about every 30 minutes. I know it sounds crazy, but it works. So they, yeah, they need to be peeing so frequently that it's not unreasonable for them to pee every 30 minutes. Okay, so that's how much liquid. Um, I should mention as well, one thing about this, my study was we didn't talk about pee and poo separately. We just taught parents this general package for elimination and it worked on both things. 
So another thing Pat was talking about is really hydrated kids are less likely to be constipated, right? It's kind of a universal. So we didn't have any constipation in this study, even though um, some of the kids actually did have a history of that. So a lot of liquids can just make that train run as well. So moving on a little. So if the trainee doesn't urinate during the scheduled toilet sitting, so you know you've got to have them on for 30 minutes, they don't go, your timer's going, what do you do? They get a two minute break off the toilet. So they can stretch, move around, play, but stay pretty close to the toilet. After two minutes, that next scheduled sitting starts. And you can imagine the break is so short because if they didn't urinate in that 30 minutes, they probably really have to go, right? They're gonna have to go really soon. So you stay really close and only keep them off the toilet for about two minutes. Um, just minimizing the chance of an accident as much as possible. Okay. So a few do's and don'ts about the scheduled sittings. Uh, do's, you absolutely must stay with the trainee while they're on the toilet. You really can't leave for anything because something we've talked about as well is those kids who just trickle a little bit, we count that as a success. Like get out the Lego box, get out the chocolate, whatever your big reinforcer is. You have to be able to hear or see or know that that's going on. And if you run to grab something, you could miss it. It really does derail the training. So catching every instance as much as possible is very, very important. Um, another important do is to use the activities you chose to keep the trainee occupied while sitting. So um, having, can't have kind of one eye, okay, iPad, yeah, that's good, that'll work. Maybe they don't want to play with the iPad all day, right? That's why a variety of activities is important. Lots of families, if they're training in the bathroom, move a little TV in there. So they've got that. They've got a stack of books. They've got magnet puzzles. They've got all sorts of stuff that can happen on the toilet. So variety is really important in that respect as well. As much as possible, just anything your, your child could possibly want that day should be in there. Why would you leave if all your favorite toys are right there in the bathtub waiting for you at arm's reach. So very important that everything is, is in the bathroom. Um, if it works for your child, do use the soft toilet seat insert, footstool. Um, just make sitting as comfortable as you possibly can. And it's also very important to have a timer and a data sheet so you know how long they're supposed to sit, when they last peed, how long of a break they get, all that sort of thing. It is pretty hard to keep straight. This is one of the reasons we're saying this isn't enough information for you to go and do it because when families work with me or other people who do what I do, we'd give you a data sheet, we'd walk you through it, we'd do day one, two, and three with you, all that sort of thing. So yeah, I'm giving you a, a ton of information that um, yeah, you'll need more detail on, certainly before you'd feel comfortable implementing it. A couple don'ts on the scheduled toilet sitting. So uh, if the trainee's bored, don't allow them to leave. You should have plenty of activities such that you can just redirect them to another one, give them another one. Um, it's, that's why it's really important to have many activities available. And if you have any doubt your child would sit this long, it should certainly be worked on before the intervention starts. This isn't the kind of problem you want to have halfway through the day they're, they're taking off or they just can't do it anymore. So working on it ahead of time can be really important. Um, don't give the trainee any activities to do that are too exciting. So if they'll be too excited to relax the necessary muscles to urinate, not a good activity to use. You some, see some kids kind of tense up when they're playing their iPad or that sort of thing. It's probably not the thing to use for while they're sitting, but maybe really good to use to give them after they actually pee or poo. Um, don't forget to watch closely. So if the trainee starts urinating or pooing, you need to be aware. You need to be able to reinforce them immediately and um, act in the way you need to act. So that's why, again, I say two people's the best. Um, it's a lot of work to just sit there all day. So having somebody, I, I mean, even meals, like going and cooking dinner isn't really an option on this, uh, on this track. So having somebody to help you with that sort of thing is a really good idea. So another component which is quite identical to what um, you would do in the long way is reinforcement for correct toileting. So if the trainee urinates in the toilet, he or she will be given a predetermined reward um, immediately after the urination has stopped. So there was some debate 
this morning about when to give the reinforcer? I think that's a really good question. Like right when they're peeing, after they've wiped and they're pulling up their pants, when do you do it? And it seems like might be a, a simple answer, but it really depends on the child. Because the first couple times, just you need to make that connection between the sound of pee, the feel of pee coming out, and a big reward coming out. So some kids, I'd say, put it on their lap just as they're finishing peeing, like they need to see it. Other kids where you're, you're more concerned about them doing the whole procedure, wiping, pulling up pants, then your reinforcer should come after the whole chain. So that's another thing you would look at depending on the child, when to give the reinforcer. But a delay in giving it is a bad thing. You don't want that. As much as possible, you don't want to go get it. You want it to be right there. Pat talked about Tupperware in the bathroom. If it's food, it should be in their hands as, as they finish peeing or as they're getting off the toilet. So that's, the speed is vital. Um, the reason I say that is you risk reinforcing something else. Sort of the longer you go, then the child might think, oh, I'm getting a pretty nice reward for walking to the kitchen where the raisins are kept. No, you're getting a reward for peeing. So putting it right next to the, putting the reinforcer right next to the act you want to reinforce in time is really, really important. So the child, again, just to talk a little more about reinforcement, if they urinate in the toilet or poop, um, they'll be given a predetermined reward immediately after they've stopped. Um, again, little wiggle room depending on the kid there. They'll also leave the toilet immediately, and remember you've got a schedule that tells you how long they get a break. So that break actually builds in really well um, if you're using something that you want to give them time access to, like we talked about bouncy balls this morning, iPad time. Because um, if you remember a couple slides back, I was saying at first it's 30 minutes on the toilet, 5 minutes break. 25 minutes on the toilet, 10 minutes break. You could always just, okay, that's how long the iPad time is. That's how long the bouncy ball time is. And then we're back on the toilet, right? So that's a good way to build it in and not confuse yourself. So you've got two timers running. Like, this is the iPad timer. This is how long your break is. Like, it's a little bit much to manage, right? So, um, yeah, having that as your time is a, is a really good strategy. Uh, within, of course, reason of how long your child needs that thing to be reinforcing and all that sort of, all that sort of guesswork that goes into it. So the reason we do reinforcement, I think, yeah, you've got a clear picture of this at this point in the day. Um, giving a highly preferred item to the trainee immediately after she or he urinates or defecates in the toilet increases the likelihood that they'll continue to do so in the future. So that's a really important part of the definition of reinforcer and what separates it from a reward. So a reward is, you know, something we like that we get when we do a good thing. A reinforcer is something that we like when we get, that we get when we do a good thing, but it makes us do that thing more in the future. So that's one of the ways you know, I don't really have a good reinforcer here because I'm not seeing more of the behavior I want. So that's a really important part of analyzing when your toilet training's not working. Like Pat said, it's probably the reinforcers. So they're very, very important. That's why I mentioned, you know, having somebody help you perform a reinforcer assessment can be a really good step in this process. So, a few do's. Um, do give the item immediately after the trainee has stopped urinating. Again, within reason, according to the kid, along with lots of praise. So, hugs, kisses, cheering, etc. This is a big deal. There's the odd kid who really doesn't like cheering, really doesn't like hugs. Just don't do it right then. You don't want to risk freaking them out, right? So, it's, it's just whatever really works for your child. Um, tell them why they're getting this reward. Yay, you peed in the potty. A lot of kids showing them you produce something can be a really, really good step in handing them the reinforcer as well. Like, oh, pee, here's the Dora playset, right? Like, they go together. That's why you're getting it. Um, and a variety of reward items available at all times. Really important. Um, Having a lot of kids are good with making choices. Pat mentioned the muffin tin. That could apply here as well. Um, a lot of kids lately I'm finding like sets of things. Like I had a child where the first time she peed, she got a barn, like a red wooden barn. She loved animals. And then each subsequent time, she just got a little plastic animal. And then by the end, as it was going on, 
her, her parents would show her the next animal and she'd like be ready to run and pee, like it's coming, right? So it, that, that ended up being something that was really motivating. So it really depends on the child. And like we've said, uh, thinking outside of the box is really important. So having one type of item, not the way to go. You're gonna dig yourself a hole that way. So you've gotta, you gotta have all sorts of things that are potentially reinforcing, especially because like I'm saying, you want your kid to pee up to 20 times a day. You got, that's a lot of access to reinforcers, so that's a lot of little plastic animals. That's a lot of Lego sets. They might be done with them by, by about 10. So having, uh, having more things available is really important to be successful. So the don'ts to the reinforcement part. Don't allow the trainee free access to the reward items. So if they can eat them or access them on their own, they won't be rewarding when you need them to. I think, I think we're all in agreement this is a pretty important one too, right? No sampling of them, like, hmm, halfway through the day, I'm not so sure he'll actually like the Kinder Egg. I'll just give him one to see. No, 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 don't do that. Just see, right, when the moment comes, if he'll choose the Kinder Egg or something else. Like, that's well, after he's actually peed, that's a little bit better. So no free access. If you've made the decision, I'm using the iPad, no iPad unless you pee or poo. It's really got to happen. Um, so a, another thing parents can do in the days leading up to the intervention is limit access to those things. So if you know, if you know you're starting, okay, Saturday's the day we start toilet training, so I'm going to really limit Joey's iPad use so he can have it all day Friday. Don't do that, right? He, he needs to really want it on Saturday in order for this to go well. So limiting access to things a few days before, especially food, seems to be a big one with that. If the kids kind of OD'd on chocolate chip cookies the day before, they're less likely to want them really bad the next day. Well, depending on the kid, but it's a possibility. Um, so yeah, I've said a couple times, using the same items all day, certainly not. A variety of items is really important, um, again, your behavior consultant can probably help you decide what some of those items might be um, and give you more ideas and sample and tell you what's likely to be the most reinforcing. Pat mentioned, don't go in with praise alone as if that's gonna do it. it it's really not gonna do it, um, especially in a long day like this. So the last point, I'm the worst offender of this, and I really know better, so this is bad, but don't get too excited if the trainee starts to urinate. It's pretty exciting. We've talked about holders, kids who hold, oh, and this is the approach for kids that hold. They need to work on it all day. Otherwise, like Pat mentioned, they'll wait for bedtime, they'll wait till you stop pushing them throughout the day. So yeah, I've, I've had big time holders, and I've been there since 7 a.m., and it's 4.30 and they finally pee and I can't contain myself. And oh yeah, oh. they always stop peeing, right? They, they kind of tense up when the crazy behavior consultant scares them, so that's good. Um, so don't, don't get too excited. I usually kind of make eye contact and nod, I, I try to, and smile, oh, you're doing it, oh. And then when they're done, oh, here's Dora, right? So wait for the moment. Again, you'll, I do it every time. I try not to, but it's just so exciting. Um, so wait until they've completely finished urinating before you give praise and rewards.